Uh, last week, uh, Chris uh, shared brilliantly with us about the woman at the well and the living water. Jesus was the living water and uh, told incredibly vulnerable stories. And, uh, and as I was sitting and listening to his sermon, I thought, uh, I think this is the beginning of a series. <laughs> I can't help it. That's just the way my mind goes. So, uh, I, we met this week and talked, and, and we're going to, between now and as we head into Easter through the uh, Lenten season, we're going to uh, be looking at uh, the ways different individuals encounter Jesus and, and, and what he does in their lives to transform them. Uh, sometimes confrontively, sometimes encouraging, sometimes uh, almost indifferently, but each one is a little bit different. And so uh, today, I'm going to do a weird one, um, because I usually take the really difficult ones and hand them to Chris, but I decided, uh, <laughs> no, why don't we just try this? So this individual that we're going to be looking at that encounters Jesus is the crowd. The crowd. And uh, crowds have personalities, they have temperaments, they have uh, behaviors that take place, and so... Uh, I want us to look at this in, in the context of uh, John chapter 6. This uh, follows very shortly after the uh, experience with the woman at the well that we heard about last week. Um, and it, you remember from Sunday school when Jesus fed the 5,000 people, there was a couple of loaves of bread and two fish and, and a big miracle. And then it said that the uh, people... Um, Verse 14, the people saw the miraculous sign that Jesus did and they began to say, surely this is the prophet who's come into the world. And Jesus, knowing that they intended to come and make him king by force, withdrew to a mountain by himself. And, uh, and then it says that in the evening time, the disciples got their boats, they went across the lake and, and Jesus met them there. And, uh, and then verse 25, when they found him on the other side of the lake, <clears throat> Uh, they asked him, Rabbi, when did you get here? And Jesus said, I tell you the truth, you're looking for me, not because you saw miraculous signs, but because you ate. You ate the loaves and the fishes. You ate your fill. That's why you're looking for me. Do not work for food that spoils, but work for food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. On him, God the Father has placed his seal of approval. And then they said, well, what do we have to do to do the works that God requires? And Jesus said, the work of God is this, to believe in the one he sent. That's your job. So they asked him, well then, what miraculous sign will you give now that we can see it and then we'll believe you? What will you do? Our forefathers ate the man in the desert. He gave them bread from heaven to eat. And Jesus said to them, I tell you the truth, it's not Moses that gave the bread from heaven, it's my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven, for the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Well then, from now on, give us this bread. And Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry, and he who believes in me will never be thirsty. The prayer of the Lord. Thank you for your word. Thank you for uh, your clarity and your passion and your engagement in our lives. And Lord, we need you more now than ever. And so we pray that you would speak into our hearts and minds and lives and draw us to yourself. That's our need. That's our prayer today. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Well, <clears throat> It's an interesting thing because um, I like being part of a crowd. You know, uh, years of being in, in big churches where, uh, you know, the throngs go, you know, and you feel like you're part of something big, there's energy in it. Um, but I remember sometimes crowds weren't all that good. We uh, went to see a play uh, in downtown San Francisco on uh, Cinco de Mayo, which just happened to be the day. And we were in the Mission District and we saw the play and when we came out, you could just smell trouble. Yeah, I don't know, it's a weird thing. It was like an intuitive kind of thing. And, um, and I looked at Eileen and I said, 
Let's not walk slow. Let's get to the car. I just don't feel good about it. Let's hear it. She goes, why, what? And usually she's pretty good at spotting trouble, you know. She was enjoying the plane. And, uh, and so we kind of raced to the car and drove off. The next morning, I opened the newspaper, and six people had been killed on that corner where we were standing. About a half hour after we drove off. And I thought, crowds can change, you know. It was a celebration. It was a, it was a happy time. <laughs> and then it turned. So crowds can do a lot of things. Um, the 12th man was a crowd that didn't do its job, obviously, this year. <laughs> I told some people I, I'd meet with them today, uh, unless the Seahawks are in the Super Bowl, then I'm not gonna, I'm, I'm gonna stay home and watch that, you know. But um, that was a joke. Was. <laughs> They're not. So um, It's not a laughing matter, Joe. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it still hurts. <laughs> I'm, this is the only church where people talk back to the back. <laughs> okay. So I'm getting high tech today. I uh, I started out. I went down to the preschool and stole their chalkboard. But then I realized it only has kind of funky colors of chalk that you won't be able to read very well, right? So Chris said, "John, he didn't say it, but it sounded like he said you're an idiot." <laughs> so he brought this to put over the chalkboard, so no one sees that I stole it from the preschool. All right, now. People sometimes have asked me over the years, uh, how do you decide what to preach, what levels of things to talk to people about in your sermons? Which is a fair question, you know. Uh, in a crowd, you have a lot of people, you have uh, a lot of different needs, even like today, in, the, in this crowd that we have today. Each one of you probably has some things going on in your head that you're still processing, that have already happened. You've got some things coming up, looming, and you're, you know, Kind of going through it. Um, you're glad when I pause when I speak because that gives you time to think about what you're going to have for lunch. You know, all those kind of things. You, you have uh, worries. You have concerns. You have anxieties. You have uh, celebration. You have happiness. You have uh, excitement. You have hope. You have fear. All of that is in this room right now. Who should I talk to? Which one of you? My biggest problems, I think, well, I have a lot of big problems, but in, in preaching is that uh, I'll say something to you, and you over here, it means something totally different, and, you, and then it doesn't make sense to you, you know? Like a person who really struggles with their self-esteem, and I say, you need to humble yourself, you know, uh, before the Lord, you, you need to... You need to uh, Grovel and recognize your sin, and, and a person with a really, really bad self-esteem is going, I know, I know. <laughs> but the salesperson on the other side of the room, who's cocky as anything, is going, not for me. <laughs> you know. And so this is really hard to know how does God speak into our lives at the levels that we have. So I'm going to give you, go back to your basic uh, uh, psychology 101. Um, and anybody who ever went to college, even for a minute, took uh, abnormal psychology, and they they got their textbook, and then they read all about their family. <laughs> <laughs> decided, I think I'll be an engineer. You know. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, well, very basic. About 1943, Abraham Maslow, a psychiatrist. Um, came up with, uh, there's a hierarchy of needs that people have in it. And he morphed them as they went along. And he didn't have a triangle. Every, every Psych 101 class has the Maslow Triangle, which he never had, actually, okay? He just had a list. Uh, and so at the very bottom, he says that the bottom need is, uh, oh, God, you can't see it. You, you want a pen with ink in it? Yeah. Okay, we'll go to this crayons. Isn't that better? Uh -huh. so, um, oh, stick with the blue. I'll get you in there. No, no, wait, 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 wait. Not prepare. Uh -huh. <laughs> I'm a trained professional. Don't mess with me. Okay, this is this is a uh, physiological. Physiological. <laughs> this is very basic. This is uh, you know our bodies need food. We need nourishment. We need a certain amount of water. 
And if we don't get that, uh, then we don't survive. We, we need to eat, we need to drink, we need to have a place to live, we need shelter from the storm. Um, <clears throat> we, you don't wanna be in Minnesota in January standing outside in your underwear, okay? There are some people who drink a little bit who do that, and every year there's, <laughs> they're on the paper we're going to their services. But, um, <laughs> don't laugh, that's tragic. <laughs> So, uh, but that's physiological. He said, you know, everybody has this, and, and if those needs are not met, it doesn't matter about anything else, right? And, and Jesus says that. He said, you know, if, if somebody is starving to death and they say, please help me, can, can I have some bread? Don't say you're going to pray for them <laughs> and walk away. Why? Because Jesus knew Maslow and said, if they're hungry, feed them. Don't worry about anything else. Let's get, get going on this. And then the next level, he said, is safety. If you feel unsafe, you're not interested in anything else other than getting through this, okay, right? And, uh, you know, I'm married to someone who has a severe anxiety disorder and uh, her whole life, and uh, it's shaped us in a lot of ways. But she is so vigilant about safety. Uh, we could drive down the street and she'll say, oh, did you see those people over there? What people? Yeah. She's aware, always looking, always looking to be ready to be prepared. And, and, this, and if she doesn't feel safe, it doesn't matter what wonderful ideas I might want to share with her. <laughs> you know? It doesn't really matter. What great, honey, we've got some plans. But if she's so... Uh, if her PTSD from the home invasion thing kicks in, nothing, she hears nothing else. And, and this is a very strong reality in our lives. You know when you feel safe. You know when you don't feel safe. And it, and it happens on several levels. It's not just a physical safety, but, but for example, you, you visit a church, you come in here like this, and you walk in, and you want to know, is this going to be a safe place for me? Am I going to be safe? Or is this a place... Uh, where I'm going to have to keep my guard up. That's a, that's a safety issue. Um, family. So is there, is there family violence? Is there uh, abuse in the home? Uh, if a child feels unsafe or a spouse feels unsafe, it's hard for them to make plans or think about more spiritual things because they don't know if they're going to get through or not. And so that's one of the needs that people have. Another one is um, love or friendship, belonging. I'm kind of adding words to Abraham and Maslow. But it's really belonging. Once you're fed, you're nourished, you're, you feel all right physically and you feel safe, uh, now you're ready. There's a need to connect. Um, to be loved, to be known, to know others, uh, to be a part of a community where, where you matter and where people know you and love you. And, and intimacy develops at this point. Intimacy doesn't develop when you're not safe. And you know who cares about uh, friendship and going to a movie when you're starting to death? <clears throat> really doesn't, doesn't factor in. But there comes a time when you need changes and now everything's okay except that you want to belong. And I'll tell you, you can be in a crowd and not feel belonging. You, there were people in the crowd uh, when Jesus was teaching that didn't feel loved, known, or that they were really a part of it. And there's probably nothing lonelier than to be in an intimate relationship with someone who you realize is kind of a stranger to you. You know, I always used to say that the loneliest people in Seattle are not single adults. They're, they're married people who are married to someone who doesn't know them or love them or pay tender care. They're indifferent. That's the loneliness that, that you can't break through. And so the crowd has all of these things going on. Then, when you're feeling loved and cared for, there's another need that comes. So you don't say, oh, I've arrived. Another need happens. And uh, let me check the chart, make sure I'm still on it. Yeah. 
this is not a self esteem. This is where you, you, you come to respect yourself and you, you don't accept other people not respecting you, not treating you uh, as a human. Whereas I'm a person of value and you want people around you who, who reinforce that you're a person of value. And then the last one, this is the one that, that uh, Abraham Maslow uh, flipped on. He started out, I call it self-actualization, okay? Self-realization, no uh, Self-actualization, which means, uh, you know, that you're, you're, you're the fullness of who you are and all those things. And then as he got older, this is the way it changed. He's a very wise person. He changed and he went, no, actually, it's not about self-actualization. It's about looking outward and caring for others. And uh, you feel so uh, valued and, and significant and cared for that you want to bless other people. He said, that actually is the, the top of the pyramid. Now, better psychology 101 class, abnormal psychology. What does this have to do with anything? Well, if you're going to understand John 6 and the crowd, you look at what Jesus does. He, he goes into each one of these levels knowing that there's people at every level. Maybe not all at the same time, and we don't, and we change places, and you know, sometimes you're you're feeling really strong self-esteem, and then something happens and you feel unsafe and you go right back there. Or you're feeling loved and cared for, and you lose your job and you're living in a tent or a van down by the river, and uh, <laughs> you know, now you're just hoping you survive. <laughs> and and the safety one I have to do with job security. I don't feel safe anymore in this job. I don't know what's gonna happen, you know. Don't be anything. You might feel strong self-esteem at work or at church, but you go home and in relationships uh, at home, you're feeling demeaned and unvalued and less. You notice how there's some people that when you're with them, you feel less, you feel less smart, less creative, less spiritual. Uh, and then you're around somebody else and you feel more smart and more spiritual. I think that's what God wants us to do with each other. So, with all of these needs, and you can identify where you've been in your life, right? Uh, different times you've been in these situations. God wants to meet us at the point of our needs. Not necessarily where we think we ought to have God meet us. And that's the point. Jesus says, you're coming after me. You're pursuing me. For what reason? Because I fed you yesterday. You're saying, Rabbi, Rabbi, teach us. We want to follow you. But you're here not because of anything I said. You're here because I fed you yesterday. I know why you're here. You want to have your needs met. And you want me to be the one who provides for you so you don't have to worry. So you can get on with love and friendship and belonging and all those other things because now it's taken care of because I will take care of all of that. That's why you're here. Right? Now he didn't criticize him for that. He just said, I know why you're here. But then he points them a different place and said, you know, God has a, has a different dream for you. It's not enough that you just get by and get fed. I mean, that was a good thing, right? But it's not enough because there's other levels that God wants to meet you. <coughs> and so he said, you know, the, God's feeding and the bread from heaven comes down. And, you know, I think the biblical word for this self-actualization or whatever that is, is um, what the Bible calls the abundant life. The abundant life. Um, I've come, Jesus said, I've come that you might have life and life abundant. And then he got weird. And Sheila asked me about this several years ago. Uh, uh, it says, uh, pressed down and overflowing. And I preached that a few times. And she came to me one day in the office and said, uh, what the heck is that? <laughs> Why do you keep saying that? And it was the idea of a, a bag of grain that you fill it up, you pour it in, you fill it up, and then it's got air pockets and stuff, and so you, you shake it and you press it down and it settles down on the bottom, and then you pour more in. 
And then you shake it and press it down and you pour more in until pretty soon it's overflowing. It's not just filling it up, it's, it's really filling it up. That's what the abundant life is that God has for us. When, when, when Christ comes into our life, sure, he's going to help us physically and protect us and guard us, I, I hope, I trust. And, and he will put us in a community of loving and belonging and, and where we matter to each other and friendship and we'll begin to feel love because we're the child of God, right? And, and we're the object of his love and our esteem goes up and then we experience the abundant life and this is not in heaven. See, that's a big mistake. It's not in heaven. Where is it? Here. It's here. Our, my old friend Bruce Larson used to say, if you don't like now, you're going to hate heaven. Because it's just more now, right? So this this abundant life is is one of the needs that we have as we grow in our faith, and uh, and if we're not experiencing that, then we need to look and say, Lord, I need you to to bring an abundant life in me that's full and meaningful and effective and outwardly focused and caring and generous, all those things. Now, the difficulty is, and uh, you know, I studied way too much psychology, but one of the problems that happened in, in the psych department at San Diego State was people took this, they took it as Bible, <laughs> yeah. and uh, they said, okay, let's start working on this. We're going to work our way up the ladder <clears throat> to get to the top. And which is what the people said. Well, what do we have to do to do the works of God? What do we do when God wants us to do something? Well, we're ready to do it. We're ready to sign up. We're going to work really hard. What is it that we do? Give us the task. Give us a, a work list, and we'll just check the stuff off. That's basically what they said in the Greek. And, uh, and Jesus said, okay, here's the work. Believe in the one he sent. That's your job. That's what God wants of you. Yeah, but what are we going to do? What you're going to do is you're going to believe in the one he sent. You're going to trust him. You're going to let him be uh, the center of your life. You're going to let him change your motivations. You're going to let him love through you when you're unloving. You're going to let him change your attitudes towards people and circumstances and situations. You're going to let him transform you from the inside out. You're going to let him give you a new vision for life. You're going to let him uh, nurture you and protect you and send you into relationships with people you may not like initially, and uh, <laughs> but you might come to love them. And... Uh, and he'll bring you abundant life. What, do, what can we do? I want to do something because then I'd be in control. And Jesus goes, ah, you know, so you can't, it doesn't work that way. If you've got to be in control, your life's got to be really small. But if you're willing to believe in the one he sends, Jesus said, then, then, uh, then we can see what he wants to do with us. I was reading uh, this week one of my favorite authors, unbelievable. <laughs> John Westfall. <laughs> anyway, the old book. But I was I was looking at it, trying to remember what I used to believe, and uh, and I found this. The abundant. I'm gonna I'm gonna read this to you, okay? Instead of just talking to you. The abundant life that Jesus offers to us is full and overflowing. It must be ours or our faith is a fraud. If there's no real joy and no abundant life or if following Christ leaves us ultimately empty, unsatisfied, and restless, then Christ's death on the cross is a disappointing failure. It leaves us no better off than we were without him. Then this plain author says, the history of humanity is a history of everyday people who take matters into their own hands. They're afraid to trust God. They refuse to step out in faith in the uncharted waters of tomorrow. They're desperately willing to do anything or try anything, anything, but receive the grace that restlessly pursues us. We want to do stuff. We don't want to be waiting for God to act and to give us grace. Grace turns our world upside down. It's so radical that it dims the shine of our success and achievement and heals the bruises and scars of our defeats and our trophies of failure. Grace reminds us 
that our greatest spiritual ecstasies, our peak moments, are not the measure of our maturity, nor are our most painful secrets the measure of our character. We need a radical infusion of grace. Grace turning our world upside down. Grace setting us free from the inside out. Grace demonstrating over and over again when I'm weak, then I'm strong. I don't know if you do what he's talking about. <laughs> so, what should we do? We can take God in his word. We can believe in the one he sent. We can receive Jesus Christ into our life as our Savior and Lord. And what did Jesus say? You, you want to be fed? You want to be nursed? You want to grow? You want to be strong? You want to have the abundant life? Then I'm the bread. I'm the one you need to eat. You need me to come into you and, and become part of who you are. Metabolize into your body. But today, we, we have a kind of a living out of, of that plane. And uh, Chris is going to come up in a minute and invite us to uh, participate in the uh, in communion together, which we take the body of Christ bread broken for us and we, and we eat it. We say, Lord, come into my life. Make me new. And you know what he does if we do that, we pray that? He will. So, pray with me. Lord Jesus, come into our hearts and minds, our lives, our, change our will, change our hopes, Strengthen our courage, quiet our fears, clear our confusion, and most of all, Lord, feed us so that we hunger and thirst no more. We long to be the men and women that you want us to be, that you envisioned when the very first time you thought of us. So have your way in us today.